the Lord. We are happy to be here another time. We are going to pick up in the book of Exodus where we left off in our time of studying. We give God thanks for allowing us to be here that we can open up his words and we can receive from him. Praise the Lord. Let us bow heads in prayer. Father, I thank you for allowing us to be here today another time in your house where we can break bread, we can come before you, Lord, and open up your words, O God, and we pray there, God, that the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding of God will be given unto us, the Holy Spirit will speak to us, our hearts, O God, will be refreshed, Father, revive us, breathe new life into our hearts there, Father, as we gather before your table today. Lord, those who are on their way, bring them safely into your house, Lord, let this be a glorious day of worship and celebration in your presence, O God. Continue to bless us, we ask of you, Father, in Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, so we are going to go back to Exodus chapter 32, and uh, we we are picking up from, from verse 19, I think. I think we picking up from verse 19. Remember we left off where Moses was on on Mount Sinai, and he was communing with the Lord. And during uh, the time he was up there, I think it was 40 days and 40 nights, he was up there, and as we studied last week, the children of Israel, they thought to themselves that Moses was dead, and they probably thought that he was consumed by the earthquake and the fire and all of the things that was taking place on Mount Sinai, and they believed that he was gone and he was not coming back to them. And they asked Aaron to make them a god. And Aaron told them to take off their earrings and all of the jewelry that they have, and he shaped it into a golden calf. And uh, they had the golden calf, put it on a pedestal, and they were worshiping this golden calf. And Moses, while all of this was going on, Moses was up on Mount Sinai. He was communion with God. God was giving him instruction and giving him the Ten Commandments. And then the Lord told him what was taking place in the camp. He told him that the people have sinned, a great sin. told him about, you know, they worshipping this calf. And the Lord told Moses to go back to the camp. So we pick up today seeing Moses... Heading back down the mountain. And as we study in previous lessons that Mount Sinai is 7,500 feet in height. So Moses went up to Mount Sinai and now he's taking his journey down, 75 feet down. You know, I guess uh, he probably would have stayed up there longer, but his, 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 um, his um, communion with the Lord had us to be cut short because of what was taking place in the camp. So we see in in verse 19, it said, And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the table out of his hand, the tables out of his hands, and break them beneath the mount. So as soon as Moses reached to a certain point where he can have a good view, of the congregation of Israel because it was about um, close to 3 million people that was out there in the desert. And uh, at this time, they were having a a great time. At at least they thought so. They were having a great time. They were um, drinking. They were eating. The Bible tells us that they they sit down um, to play and then they they rose up uh, in in, in whatever... um, immorality that they had in their mind, they played out. Uh, it tells us that the people was naked, so they undressed themselves and they were having, it was like an a orgy they were having. It was a lot of um, immorality that was taking place, adultery and fornication that was going on amongst them there. And Moses saw that, and the Bible said, and Moses' anger wax hot. In other words, Moses become angry. You know, um, as we study in previous chapter, we saw that the children of Israel, they did a lot of things 
to Moses personally. They insulted him. They called him all kind of names. And Moses did not get upset when he was personally attacked by the children of Israel. But here we see that when he saw what they were doing, what they were involved in, that they were worshipping this calf of gold, that caused him to become angry. The Bible said, and Moses' anger waxed hot. And I guess that the message that we can take from this is that we ought not to be so, um, you know, picky where, when people attack us personally and people say things against us personally. Sometimes we take it real personal when people, you know, make fun of us, people accuse us, people take personal shots at us. But, you know, as, as children of God, we ought not to be so, you know, um, picky and so um, concerned when people attack us. As in the case of Moses here, as I said before, the children of Israel attacked Moses several times, but he didn't really respond in this way. He didn't get upset. Didn't get angry until they were attacking his God. And I think that's a, a good um, example that we can set. In we, we get angry when people say things about the Lord or people do things that is wrong, you know, where God is concerned. It, it causes us to go into a state, as the Bible describes it, as, um, you know, um, spiritual um, indignation. In that we become angry because people are violating God's command. And we see this was what was taking place here with Moses. Moses become angry. He was consumed. He walks, his anger walks hot. But also, this was not the ordinary anger that we probably might express today. You know, when somebody says something about you, you get so angry and you get mad with them and you feel that you could take their heads off. Um... This is not what Moses is feeling here. The anger that he is experiencing here, it is um, mingled with the love of God. You know, he has God's love and God's fear within that anger. His anger walks hot and he casts the table, tables or this is the tablets of stone that the commandment was written on. They were written on both sides. It was two he had in his hands. And he broke them beneath the mount. So Moses... You know, he forget all about, you know, what was going on on Mount Sinai, the beautiful communion that he had up there with the Lord, and uh, the purpose of the commandment, the commandment was to, for him to bring it down and read it out to the children of Israel. But he came down, and he, when he saw what was taking place amongst the children of Israel, he just took those two um, tables of stone with the commandment, and he cast it down. I remember, um, if my memory served me correctly, that was years ago. It was maybe close to what? 40 years ago, I probably saw uh, the Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston, <laughs> in the, the Ten Commandments. And if I remember correctly, I think when he threw down um, the, 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 the tables of stone, because he had one tablets of stone, and when he threw it down, I think it, it caused like an earthquake, and there was an eruption. Yeah. And, uh, but the Bible never really tells us that here. It didn't really say... Um, you know, anything happened here. But, you know, the, in the movie, <laughs> but we are not talking about the movie here, we're talking about the Bible. Moses threw down uh, the two tables of stone and he broke them. And uh, the breaking of the commandments here, or the tables of stone, is an example to, is to, it, it, it's, uh, is to show Israel that they have broken God's command. They have broken the command of God. And when they broke the command of God, there is a consequence. They have to, anytime the command of God is broken, anytime the command of God is disobeyed, whoever disobeyed the command of God have to pay a consequence. They have to, they have to um, pay for that because the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin, the payment for breaking God's command is death, spiritual death. And also, physical death could be um, there too. Praise the Lord. So, he, yes, go ahead. I was looking at this thing, I was just studying for the, for the, for the week, I was just yes. contemplating on this thing, this, this message day. I was, we was talking about concerning the, um, the, 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 um, the idol, the image that they make. Yes. 
I, I have been thinking, I say, look at that. Satan himself, there was a real big attack by the powers of darkness. Yes. I look back, I, I went back to uh, um, Genesis, I think Genesis chapter 2, where, he come, where Satan tempted the woman, right? Yes. And he get, he get her to fall. Mm -hmm. And now that um, Satan um, intervened, there was a, uh, intervened with the children of Israel to make them change their minds. So, mm -hmm. so I believe that Satan realized that God was doing something very important. He was preparing the way for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And he going to use that way to take on the children from Israel, bring them into the promised land to prepare for Christ to come. Mm -hmm. so, so he tells us that if he gets the children of Israel to change their mind to worship another God, maybe God is going to change his mind completely and just forget the whole plan completely. Because that's a big insult in God's face yes. by choosing a, a God over him. So God, God could change his mind and Christ would never come. So you all I could have salvation today. So that was a, a tremendous attack by the powers of darkness. Well, I yes, uh, it, it was, that was not just the children of Israel doing it. It was instigated by, by Satan. You know, the devil was, um, he was the one who was instigating them to, to do that because, you know, they, they, and he do it in a kind of subtle kind of way. He do it in a way that the people think that they were worshiping God because they, they make this idol, this image, this scarf of gold, but they think that the worship that it was given to the idol was going to um, Jehovah. So he is right. And uh, it was a personal attack by the devil against the children of Israel. Satan, he, he knew, he knew that where they were heading. He knew that God was taking them to a better place. And uh, he, was, he was putting all kinds of obstacles. This was another obstacle in, in the way of the children of Israel. You know, and uh, they, they did not, it was a test. They didn't pass that test. So um, here uh, the Bible tells us in verse 20, And Moses, and he, there is Moses, He took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and, he, uh, and ground it to powder, and strode it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. So, uh, we can understand that when he said that he take the, the calf, and he, um, he burned it, and then he grind it to powder, it is believed that the calf probably was make up, probably the, the shell of it was wood, and they probably put the outside with a, a, a gold plate. Because when you think about it, gold, it's hard to really burn gold. It takes real intense heat to really consume gold. So, um, Bible scholars believe that maybe they designed the outside with wood, the inside, well, the inside with wood, and the outside they put um, a gold plate. But what he's saying here that he burned it first, so maybe the wood part probably burned, and then the gold... He smashed it fine, and it become like powder. And then what it said here, he spread it upon the waters, the water. And uh, this is giving us a, 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 another um, highlight here that they had water out there. Because when you read in um, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy tells us that there was a stream there was a stream coming down from Mount Sinai and flowing down. So this is the same stream that Moses take um, the, 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 the dust from the golden calf and he sprinkle it over the water. And uh, if you read in um, uh, 1 Corinthians, I think, chapter 10, or 2 Corinthians chapter 10, one of those um, books, you will see where Paul... He was talking about uh, the children of Israel, how they disobey the Lord. And he talked about the goodness of the Lord that, you know, the Lord showed to them. And then at one part, he talks about the rock that was following them. And that rock was Christ. And uh, some uh, Jewish interpret this to mean that the children of Israel had, the, you, you remember when Moses struck the rock out there in the desert and water came up from the rock? They believe that that rock was literally following the children of Israel wherever they go and water was produced from that rock. So here we see that he's saying here that they had water out there. A stream was flowing down from the mountain and uh, Moses was able to spread the, 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 the remains of the golden calf over the water. 
And here we see that he said he made um, them to drink, the children of Israel to drink it. So um, it seems as though Moses really has some strong influence over the people because after he grind that, um, the remains, he grind the golden calf to powder, he take the remains of it and he throw it into the water and he make the people drink it. You know, so uh, that is showing me there that he has some kind of um, um, command or some kind of authority or maybe the people, maybe they wasn't fear of him, I don't know, because of the sin that they have committed, the great sin that they have committed. But they, after he spread the remains of the golden calf in the water, he commanded people to drink it. And also what that is showing us by them um, have to drink this remain from the golden calf is that Moses, I guess, is making them identify themselves with the sin. They, I, they, have, to, they have also identify themselves with the sin by drinking um, the, the, the powder from the golden calf. That become a part of them, so they have also identify with the sin that they have committed. And that is what sin is all about. You know, sometimes people will want to live in sin, but... They don't want to, they don't want to um, identify with it. They will say, well, it's not really that bad. But once you are living in sin, that sin that you are living in become a part of you. And you have to own up to it. To get out of it, you have to own up to it. You can't be living in sin and pretend that you're not living in sin. You're not going to get any deliverance. The people who receive deliverance from sin is the people who acknowledge that they are living in sin. The Bible tells us that the person who cover their sin will not prosper. But he who confess and forsake will have mercy. So here Moses is making them drink of the powder from the, the golden calf, put it on the water, and they had us to drink it. And that means that they identify um, with the sin. And in verse 21, And Moses said unto Aaron, what did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And what I believe is happening here in verse 21 is that Moses is calling Aaron to account. He is holding Aaron accountable of what takes place here because he is the one when Moses was going up to Mount Sinai Moses leave um, Aaron and Hur in charge of the congregation. And here we see that Moses is calling Aaron to account. And I guess what we can take from this verse here is that when we are in leadership, when a person is in leadership, leadership is a privilege. Anytime, le leadership is not a right. Nobody has the right to lead. <laughs> You know, although some political um, parties and leaders think that they have the right to, to lead, even some church leaders, would, they act as if, well, they have the right. It's a right that is given to them to lead. Any kind of leadership is a privilege. Leadership is a privilege. And uh, that privilege, it comes with um, responsibility and it comes with accountability. If you are in any kind of leadership, it means that you are responsible. You, you, you have to be a responsible person. And not only that, you have to be accountable. If you are in leadership, it means that you are responsible and you are, account you are accountable to somebody. You know, sometimes you hear people will express themselves and they will say, well, I am in charge of this, you know, and, and I will do, I can do whatever I want to do. And, you know, once you put me in charge, nobody can really tell me what to do again. You know, because once you put this responsibility upon me, I'm in charge of it and I do what I please. That's not how it goes where leadership is concerned. When a person is in leadership, they always have people who they are, account who, who they are accountable to. You know, even in the church, I am in leadership here, but I am accountable to you. It doesn't mean because I am in leadership and I am the pastor of this church, I can just do what I want, live how I want to live, and say, well, I'm the pastor and I'm not accountable to anybody. So therefore, nobody can say anything to me. Nobody can tell me anything. No. I, you, I am accountable to you. And it's the same thing too. You are accountable to me. We all are accountable to each other. We are not on our own. As sometimes we say, well, I'm my own man or I'm my own woman and I make my own decision. 
Yes, you make your own decision, but you are accountable to somebody. So here we see that Moses is holding Aaron accountable. He is the one who is in charge, and he is the one who um, the people asked him permission to make this calf of gold. He did not put up any resistance. And he is the one that Moses is um, he's putting his feet to the fire, so to speak. Praise the Lord. And as we discussed last week, when you are in leadership, um, whether it's in the church or in the home or on the job, it's not everything that the people ask for, you could give it to them. <laughs> you have to make sure that what the people ask for is right. In the church, what the people ask for have to be right before you can um, okay, because if you okay something that is not right, God is going to hold you responsible. The same thing in the home. You know, the children will ask for a lot of things. A lot of times children ask parents for a lot of things. And because the parents... They know that it is not right. They can't really um, give it to them. And, you know, most times that a uh, child would ask for something and the parents don't give it to them, the child is going to throw a temper tantrum. child is going to get on upset and, they, you know, stomp their foot on the ground and maybe throw down whatever they're eating or whatever, decide they're not going to eat or whatever. But the parents got to stand their ground. And it's the same thing where leadership is concerned. Praise the Lord. We have to be strong as leaders. And we are not talking about um, bullheaded, you know, somebody who's stubborn. And in spite of the fact that they might be wrong what they're doing, they're not changing and they're not giving up because them is the leader. We're not talking about that. We are talking about when you know something is right and you have evidence that something is right, you cannot go against it. You have to stand for what is right. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Verse um, 22. And Aaron said, so Moses is holding Aaron accountable in verse 21 and verse 22. Aaron is re responding to Moses. And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. So he's telling Moses, um, cool down a bit, you know. Um, let me explain. Let me give you the, the explanation. Thou knowest uh, the people that they are set on mischief. <laughs> Aaron said to Moses, you know what kind of people you're dealing with. You know what kind of people you leave me in charge of. And uh, Aaron, ha he, he have a point there. <laughs> because these people wasn't really easy. Even, you remember when they came out from um, Egypt, Moses just stretched forth his rod and the Red Sea was divided. They walk across on dry land. They saw all of the dead bodies of the Egyptian army floating on the shores of the Red Sea. And then when they, you know, pass over, they become thirsty. Whatever water supplies they probably had, it probably ran out and they didn't have any water. And they become upset and they were ready to, to stone Moses. So um, Aaron is just reminding Moses here what kind of people the children of Israel was. He said, to the, he said to him, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. What a way to um, describe <laughs> somebody. What a way to describe God's people. What a way to describe somebody that you know. And when I was studying this last night, this morning too, it came to my mind. When somebody look at me, or when somebody look at you, how does they think about you? When somebody look at you as an individual, for instance, I'm up here and I'm looking at Brother Lewis. How do I think about Brother Lewis as, as a person? You know, what, when I think about Brother Lewis or think about Brother McKenzie or think about Brother Hostick, what comes to my mind? Like, oh, Aaron, he come to Aaron's mind here when you think about the children of Israel, that they are a bunch of people that is bent on doing mischief. We, I think, we should take this into account in that we're trying to put ourselves in the light of how other people would think about us. How, how, do, people think, how, how do you think people think about you? When we look at this um, verse here, Aaron is saying that these people are a bunch of... Um, 
rebellious people and they are mitch, mischief makers. They bent on doing mischief. How do people think about us is very important. And brother, brothers and sisters, the impression, the, the, the way how we conduct ourselves before people is very important. When, when we conduct ourselves in a bad way before people, it's going to have a lasting effect upon them. The way you conduct yourself before people, every time they see you, they, <laughs> you know, um, the impression that you give them, that is what they're going to remember. The last impression that that person has of you, they're going to always remember that. So that's why, you see, it's very important for us to really try to conduct ourselves you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way, you know, not just in front of people, but in a general sense, we, we, have, we, we conduct ourselves all the time in a good way so that, you know, we are not just doing it for people to have something good to say about us. Because the Bible says that a, a good name is rather to be chosen than many riches. So we have a responsibility to really conduct ourselves in a good way so that people can, you know, have something good to say about our character. Praise the Lord. He's saying here that these people were bent on mischief. And in reality, he, he really is giving a, a good description of the children of Israel. Most of them, the majority of the congregation of the children of Israel was really a bunch of mischief makers. Verse 23, For they said unto me, Make us gods, which shall go before us, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. So Aaron is giving the explanation here, and he's telling, um, he's telling Moses what the children of Israel said to him. Make us God, which shall go before us, for as for this man Moses, that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. They, as we said before, they are giving their deliverance to, not to God. They are not saying here that God delivered them. They didn't really think that it's God that delivered them out of Egypt. They are giving the credit for their deliverance to the man Moses. And because Moses was away for 40 days and 40 nights, they didn't see him. They lost all hope. And Aaron is saying here that they asked him to, to, to make this um, image or this calf of gold because they wasn't sure what was taking place with Moses. And here in verse 24, and I said unto them, whosoever had any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. Then I cast it into the fire and there came out this calf. Look at the innocent explanation Aaron is giving here. Aaron is saying here, they told me to make them um, gods. And I said to them, break off your golden um, earrings and whatever jewelry you have. And here, I just take it and innocently, I just throw it into the fire. And look, Moses, this is what came out. I wasn't really planning this. I wasn't, um, you know, this is not something that we plan to do. But it happened that I, they asked for the, the, the gods to be made. I asked them to give them uh, to give me the, the, their jewelry, and I innocently take it and throw it into the fire, and there came out this image, uh, 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 the golden calf. But that's not what really happened. <laughs> it, 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 the way how Aaron portrayed there that he just threw this thing in the fire, and this calf came out, that is not the way it happened. And a lot of times we take a, a leaf, or we take the same pattern that Aaron is given here when we get into trouble, when we get ourselves into things that we're not supposed to get ourselves in, you hear people say a lot of times, well, we didn't really plan this to happen. You will, you know, see a man and a woman uh, get into adultery or get into fornication. Maybe a husband 
he um, leave his wife and he fall for next woman or a woman fall for next man. And you'll hear they give this innocent explanation. Well, this is not something that we really plan, you know. We were just only talking casually. Oh, you know, he just used to give me a ride home. And, you know, sometimes he only just used to call me on the phone. And, you know, maybe sometimes on the job and uh, when we have break time, we used to talk, just um, friendly talk. Or we just used to make a little joke with one another. And it was just something innocent. And uh, we didn't really plan for anything to happen. And lo and behold, this is the condition that we find ourselves in. But it, these things that we give these little simple explanation about, don't just simply happen like that. It takes a lot of planning to get into sin, to do any kind of sinful activity. And we are talking like sin, like fornication and adultery. For a man to leave his wife and go with an ex-woman, don't just happen like that. <laughs> You have to do a, a lot of planning for a woman to leave her husband and go with the next man. You have to do some planning. That thing will just happen overnight. Uh, like how Aaron said, he just threw the, 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 the gold into the fire and it came out. Lo and behold, this thing came out. Some, some planning went into it. Praise the Lord. And it means here that Aaron, he was not taking responsibility of what happened. He was, he was using excuses. Yes. Bring it, bring it more up. Bring the mic more back. Yeah. Bring it back. Yes. Yeah, uh, as, we, I know that, uh, as, as we know that the devil orchestrated this problem. So uh, I see another thing there. Okay. It was something really profound and very, very significant took place there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, 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 the spirit of um, anarchy yes. create a serious evolution. And we see it happening today. So it was a revolution that took place there. So he couldn't do that, um, Iran couldn't do much thing about it. Because if people revolt, it's, it's, like, it's like change they want, compl- it's a complete change they want it. Because the, the leader is not there. And we see it happening all over the world, the revolution. They want complete change. They don't satisfy with how rules and regulation is going. They don't want it at all. Mm. So they want change. So they create this revolution. So, so in, in that sense, you know, Iran didn't have, he, he couldn't do nothing about it. Because re- people revolt. Well, he probably, um, uh, maybe he was not able to stop them. But then, because of the fact that he stayed silent, he never really, he didn't really deny them. He was the one who was in charge. I know what you're saying. It was uh, a lot of people, and if they really wanted, even though he decided he was going to say no, and they really wanted to overpower him, they, could, they would have done it. But the thing is, he did not say anything. He did not say no to them. He, he more or less, he sided with them. Whether or not he was in fear of them, as he said uh, to Moses, you know the kind of people that you have here. <laughs> and a lot of times, um, when we find ourselves in these hard um, uh, situation, because of the fact that we don't really want people to um, get on our case, or people maybe to maybe physically harm us at times, or with their mouth they might harm us, we decide that we're not going to say anything. Just uh, let them do what they want. You know, even though I say no, they're still going to do whatever they want. So let me just stay silent. But uh, what we're saying is that when you are chosen by God to lead, even though you put up a stand and say, well, this is wrong, and the people decide they're going to trample you to death, you still have to say that it is wrong and take your trampling to death. It's not anything, it's not an easy thing. It's a hard thing. So, Aaron, he really failed in the sense that he did not, he did not put up a, a fight. He did not say, well, this is wrong. He did not say, that this is wrong, and this is wrong to do. He gave in to them. Praise the Lord. Okay, where we are? Twenty-five. And when Moses saw that the people were naked... For Aaron had made them naked unto their shame amongst uh, their enemy. The people was naked. A lot of the people take off their clothes. They were having an orgy going on, having a big kind of sex party that was going on, dancing and having a good time. And the, the Bible said in 25, when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame, among uh, the enemy. You see what nakedness. Nakedness is shameful. Public nakedness. 
Nakedness in privacy, there is nothing shameful about it. You know, nakedness, adult, consenting adults or married adults, naked in privacy, there is nothing shameful about that. Because the Bible said marriage is honorable in all and the bed is undefiled. But whomongers and adulterers, God will judge. But when you are naked in public, it's a shameful thing. I know people today see it as art. <laughs> but when you are naked in public, it's a shameful thing. And nakedness in public is one of the four signs of somebody demon possessed. Anytime you see Satan take over the life of a person, the first thing they start to do is strip off their clothes. Start to take off your clothes and you're heading to a place where you could be public, where people could see you. So nakedness is a sign of demon possession. And uh, what the Bible is saying here, nakedness leads to shame. And what I'm trying to get to is that we ought not to allow ourselves to be naked in the sense that um, certain parts of our bodies are exposed as men and women, especially in the church, dressing on the street. We have to be very careful that sensitive parts of our body, you know, as I keep saying over and over, I keep saying this. I don't think we really have a problem here in this church because you know, I guess I say it so much. But, you know, you see a lot of Christians today, the way how they dress, they try to expose um, certain parts of their bodies. And when a woman, especially exposing certain parts of her body, sensitive parts of her body, she's looking for attraction, she's looking for attention. She's calling for attention. <laughs> she wants somebody to give attention to her. But as a child of God, we, 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 you can't do that. Praise the Lord. Because, um, ladies, you know, anytime you see you have to expose sensitive parts of your body so that you can get the attention of a man, guess whose attention you're going to get? It's the bad boy. It's the bad boys on them. The bad boys on them in the church because there's a lot of bad boys in the church, you know. The bad boys in the church, them is the one who look in to see, you know, the short mini skirt and the split between the legs so that, you know, the legs exposed and they see the breast, you know, exposed and stuff like that. It's the bad boys who are looking for that. But the good man of God, the man of God looking for a woman that is, you know, dressed properly, decent. You know, no man of God wants to see their, you know, intended wife, you know, to be exposed like that. <laughs> Sensitive parts of... A woman's body is only for that chosen person to see in private. You know, I like that about the, um, the Muslim people, the Muslim people. Not that I like their religion, but uh, I don't really like how they, how they have their women covered from head to toe. I'm not, not that I'm talking about. But their um, thing is that um, their women should only expose their um, sensitive parts of their body to their husband alone. And that is how it should be. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I got a friend at work, and uh, he said that he's not, uh, based on their religion, he's not supposed to, uh, he's not allowed to change his clothes in front of his wife. He would go to the bathroom, and I uh, usually change the clothes he have to get out of, of the room. They're not supposed to expose themselves be, before each other. Okay. Yeah. That's their religion. Yes. <laughs> well, well, yes. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> um, I kind of, I, I don't really, I don't really, I'm not going to say that is a part of my religion. But I personally, if I'm in the bathroom, I don't want my wife to come in. I don't want her to just boss in on me and I'm in the bathroom. I, I don't really like that. I, I kind of, even though we are husband and wife, and you know, from time to time we, we get it on from time to time, you know what I mean? But I kind of want to have some kind of privacy. You know, when I'm in the bathroom, I like to know that I'm in there by myself. You know, I don't really like anybody boasting at me. I mean, so if we plan to go in together, you know, it's a different thing. But if you're in there by yourself, you know, you kind of want to be there by yourself and it's your own private space. So I understand that. But that is not a part of religion, you know. But, you know, even though you're husband and wife, still you're entitled to have some kind of privacy. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. So... Um, we touch on um, nakedness. It, it leads to um, shame. Verse um, 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? 
let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gather themselves together unto him. So here we see this was an invitation here for all the people to repent. All the people have an opportunity here to turn from that wickedness that they were committing there. Moses, God is giving them an opportunity here to repent. By saying, all who is on the Lord's side, come on to me. Everybody there who was involved in that um, sinful activity, have an opportunity right there and then to change their mind and say, well, let me just give up what we're doing and let me just go on Moses' side. But look what happened. It said, um, um, who is on the Lord's side? Let him um, come unto me and all the sons of Levi gather themselves together unto him. The sons of Levi here is from Moses' family. This is Moses' relative. This is Moses' tribe. Uh, these men, whether or not they were involved in what was going on, they heard the call from Moses. They, know, they knew that they were doing something that is wrong. They gather on to Moses. And not just them alone, but I think a lot of people did too. But it, 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 make, it single out here the tribe of Levi for a, a specific purpose. He said in verse 27, And he said unto them, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So here we see that Moses said to the, the, the tribe of Levi, Put on your sword. And go from camp to camp. And every person who did not break off what they were doing, every person who did not get their clothes and put their clothes back on, <laughs> and, you know, smarten up themselves, he said, here, take your sword and go from camp to camp, tent to tent, and everybody who still want to continue with what they were going on with, they get so overwhelmed with their activity because it was a lot of sexual um, activity that was going on there in the camp and some of these guys, uh, some of these girls they decided that they're not going to break up what they're doing even though they were caught right in the, in, the, in the act they didn't want to give up what they're doing, continue what they're doing Moses is saying here to the Levite take out your sword and kill them I know, you know, when we come across these hard things in the Bible, it's kind of hard for us to explain and you'll find a lot of unbelievers will say, well I can't really believe in the Bible because look at these things that they um, some of these things that God commands uh, to take place. But, you know, when you have some of these things um, going on in Bible time, you have to take action against it because it's going to spread. And it's just like if you have an infection in certain parts of your body, for instance, you have uh, a finger that is infected and you are in a place where, you know, they don't have uh, proper treatment for that thing. Sometimes the best way to um, treat that um, infected um, member of the body is to cut it off. Because if you don't cut it off, the rest of the body will become infected. And instead of losing one member, you'll lose the whole body. So here, God is taking um, this drastic action because God, He don't want to lose the whole congregation. So He have to get rid of the rebellious people, those who didn't want to break off their wickedness. God is saying to the Levi, take them out. Praise the Lord. So uh, he said in 27, and he said unto them, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword uh, by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate, gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbors. So here, the Levites couldn't show no favor, even though somebody was their relative, even though one of the guys who continued doing what he was doing, he was one of the Levites' son. They could not favor even their son, their brothers or their sisters. They had also kill and get rid of that person who didn't break off their, their sinful activities. Uh, verse 28, And the children, of Is the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. So the Levi with their sword killed about 3,000 men who rebelled and they didn't want to stop their sinful um, action. They were taken out by the Levi. Verse 29. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourself today to the Lord, every uh, man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. So uh, because of this act that the Levites did, 
God consecrate them. They become a, a special um, unit in the, uh, amongst the children of Israel. They were the one that was chosen um, to take care of the, 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 the Levitical uh, priesthood because of their stand for the Lord. In verse 30, and it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Preadventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. This was a great sin in the sight of God that Israel was committing here, worshiping the golden calf. And Moses let them know it was a great sin. And uh, they have to get um, pardoned. They have to be pardoned. You have to go to God and you have to make atonement. Their, their, their fellowship with God was broken. The word the atonement means to be at one. That relationship that Israel had with God, they, it was broken. So therefore, they had us to be brought back into fellowship, into relationship with the Lord. Verse uh, 31. Praise the Lord. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. So here we see Moses, he had to climb back up the mountain. Um, Mount Sinai is 7,500 feet high. Moses just came down. He went up first. You remember he went up the first time? He's an old, well, you know, he's over 80 years. And he went up there 7,500 feet. And then he, the Lord informed him that the people is committing sin. He have to come back down 7,500 feet. And now he's going up back another 7,500 feet up that mountain so that he can make atonement for the people. You see the kind of stress here that the people is putting on Moses? <laughs> Moses, he is not the one who is um, doing um, the wrong or doing the sinful things. But it seems as though he is the one that is taking all of the burden. And uh, I don't think the people really appreciate what Moses was really doing for them. And I don't think they really understand the kind of stress that they were really putting on Moses. You know, to be in leadership, especially in the church, is a very stressful thing. I'm going to share with you right now. Right now, I know we don't have a big church, the smaller church we have here. But going on in, in my life right now, the most stressful thing I have in my life right now is the church <laughs> because there is so many things that you have to think about there's so many things that you have to do you know you have to think about this you have to think about that <laughs> you have to think about the growth of the church you have to think about preaching the most stressful thing in my life right now is really the church and uh, you know sometimes you see we down here on saturdays and you hear um from time to time i'll say to you guys it's time for us to go time for us to go you know because Saturdays, I have to go home and I have to get my mind in gear. It takes me about four or five hours to get my mind prepared, to settle down and get my mind prepared. So when I come here on Sunday morning, I have something. I am able to explain the Word of God. I don't take notes. I don't write down anything. I just, I have to go and I have to study and I have to go over Literally, I just more or less go over what I'm going to say here to you. I go over that in my mind and make sure that is recorded on my brain or on, in my spirit. And when you see I'm up here, all of the things, all of the things that I study and I meditate on and I pray over, it's like that television screen, you know, I, it's like I'm seeing it, it's like I'm hearing it, but it takes a lot of preparation. So leadership is very stressful. The most stressful thing in my life right now, is the church. This is not to say I'm going to give it up, but I'm only letting you know. So it, to be in leadership is not something that is easy. It's a stressful thing. And Moses was experiencing um, all of the stresses that the people was um, putting upon him here. He had to go up back Mount Sinai to make atonement for them. Verse 31, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, All these people have sinned a great sin and have made themselves a golden calf. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sins, and if not, blot me, I pray thee out of thy book which thou hast written. There's a whole lot here that we can say about um, Moses' request here. He, he more or less, he's in prayer. And he's saying to God, I'm asking you to forgive them, but if you're not going to forgive them, take my name out of the book. Take my name from out of the record. In other words, 
um, the, 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 the opportunity that I have to go to heaven. Erase that. Eliminate that. It is the same kind of prayer that um, so, uh, 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 Paul prayed when he said that, um, he, you know, he rather be, to become an outcast, you know, and Israel to be saved. He rather that his soul was lost and, you know, Israel become saved. You know, on the behalf of Israel, Paul was ready to sacrifice his life on the behalf of the children of Israel. And it's the same thing Moses is doing here. He was willing to give up um, him being with the Lord and him going to heaven so that Israel could have a chance, an opportunity to be with God also. It, it shows us here the kind of heart that Moses had. He had a heart for the people. Although these people were sinful and rebellious, Moses still loved them. I think this is sending a great message to us today as leaders. That even though some of our people might be rebellious, they might be hardened, they're stiff naked. And, you know, sometimes they don't even deserve for us to really love them. But still, we still, have to, we still have to love them. As leaders, we still have to love them. Because they are God's people. And God don't give up on them, so therefore we can't give up on them either. And this is what Moses is, is, is doing here. But the part that I want to get to is where he said that, um, blotting out his name out of the book. Now, I believe that every person that is in the world today, every person, when a person is born, when a person comes into the world, I believe that their name is in the book of life. Even before that person make a decision to get saved, that person's name is in the book of life. But at a certain stage of that person's life, when they make a decision that they're not going to accept Jesus Christ, because when you, even though, even though you are, uh, you're, you're, you're still alive and you're not dead yet, you're alive and you make a decision that you're not going to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you probably might live another 25 years, but God already knows that you already make up your mind that you're not going to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So when you make up your mind that you're not going to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, God remove your name from out of that book. Your name is taken out of that book. According to, um, you know, what I, I, um, I think by putting other scriptures together. He's saying here, so Moses is saying, take my name out of the book. Every person, every baby, every child came into the world. They came into the world with the name is in the book. But at a certain stage of their life, and God already knew their heart, knew that that person is not going to make a decision for him, their name will be taken out. Praise the Lord. Um, in closing, therefore now go, lead the people on to the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, my angel shall go before thee. Um, nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit uh, their sins upon them. So here we see what happened here. There's a whole lot in this last uh, couple of verses here, is that God withdrew his presence from the nation of Israel. God was leading the, the children of Israel. He was there with them. You know, all the time. But because of their sinful activity, because of their involvement with the, the worship of the golden calf, God decided that he's going to withdraw his presence from them. Because if God continued to be with them as he was before, the Israelite will be consumed. So what he's doing here, the presence of God is going to be replaced by an angel. God is going to send an angel to go before them. And God is going to stay at distance. He's going to stay at distance away from Israel for their own protection. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sins upon them. God is going to make them pay for their sins. When a person sin, even though they are forgiven, you, when we sin, certain sins that we commit, even though we ask God to forgive us, still we are going to have to pay for it in our body. And a lot of, some people may not agree with that. When you commit certain sins, even though you pray and ask God to forgive you, you still have to pay the consequence of that sin in your body, in this life. For instance, um, let's suppose um, uh, somebody, a Christian person, or anybody should go out and commit fornication, and they pick up um, uh, venereal disease or AIDS or any kind of one of those diseases, um, and they come back and they ask God to forgive them, they go before God on their knees and let him know how sorry they are and they ask for forgiveness. The Lord forgive them of their sin. You think God is going to take away the consequence of that disease? The AIDS that they pick up out there, you think because of the fact that they repent, 
They go before God, they come before the altar, you throw a whole bucket of oil upon them and ask God to heal them. Because they say they repent. You think God is going to heal them of that age? No, they're going to suffer the, conse- the, que- the consequence of their action. They'll have to suffer it. Even though they are forgiven, they still will have to pay for that. So certain sins that we commit, even though the Lord forgive us, in our body, we're going to have to pay for it. 35 in closing. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. God plagued the people. The word they plague is a dangerous thing. When you talk about plague, if you look up the word plague, the first thing come to uh, your eyes, you see the bubonic plague. You remember in Europe years ago they had that plague that killed millions of people. Plague is like, you know, things that will come into the congregation. I don't know if it was different animals that the Lord sent in or maybe flies or bees or whatever the Lord sent in to plague them. God make them pay for what they did. Praise the Lord. It's a serious thing if God has to send plagues into our lives. Brethren, let us be admonished today. Let us uh, walk in, in the way that will be pleasing in the sight of God. I'm not saying that we're going to be perfect all the time. But let us not um, walk in a rebellious way before the Lord because in our rebellion, God is going to hold us responsible and he will judge us. Praise the Lord. God bless us. Anybody have any question uh, before we close or any comments before we close? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Brother Hastic, ask God's blessing as we close. Heavenly Father, we, we welcome you here this morning. And we give you praise and we give you honor. And we give you glory. You are an awesome God, Lord, and you are worthy to be praised. Had not been for you, Lord, where would we be? But because of your grace and mercy, Lord, we are here today to thank you and to worship you, Lord, in the beauty of holiness. Hallelujah. Lord, Father God, I give you praise. I lift your holy name this morning, Lord. Lord, as we continue with the service, Lord, Lord, I pray that you would touch the man of God as he bring out your word, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would touch each and every one here today, those that couldn't make it and those that is here today. Lord, I pray that you would bless them and lift them up, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would touch Straight Gate Ministry, any weapon that formed against this church, Lord. I pray that you would blot it out in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you will bring, um, um, could she say the word? Increase. Uh, increase the congregation here this morning, Lord. As we continue to pray for an increase, Lord, I pray that you will lift us this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.